Good morning. Welcome again to St. Patrick. So glad uh, that you're all here. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Uh, if you've been with us the past uh, few weeks, you've seen us walk into the beginning of a series on Acts that we've called Heaven is Local. And uh, Jim rightly identified the past couple of weeks as the tipping point. So what we're going to see this morning is what is it that we've been tipped into? If we spent all this time in the first seven chapters uh, of the book of Acts in Jerusalem, and then now something has tipped, where are we headed? What's going on? So uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses that we actually covered last week, but they're really relevant uh, in in creating context for a a very familiar story we're going to hear this morning. This is Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But... There was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him, because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God, And the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying uh, on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you've said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we know that all of our flesh and glory are grass and flowers which fade and fall. It's that your word alone flourishes forever. So find us here where the frailty of humanity dwells with the fullness of divinity. In Christ Jesus, our risen and reigning King. And pour out your Spirit upon us that we might be His witnesses until heaven is local to the ends of the earth. It's in His name we pray. Amen. There's a town not too far from us uh, in the West that is known for its magic. Hot Springs, Arkansas. There, there's something about the lore of that town uh, that, that it kind of connects with some, some distant memories we might have about what happens in Scripture when people uh, get blessed with a certain kind of water and, and are renewed and healed by that. So much so that they've sort of adopted this lore uh, and their, their theme park is called Magic Springs. 
Well, about a year and a half ago, um, our junior high camp got canceled because of, you know, COVID with some counselors as things happened back then. And so we very quickly pivoted and decided we were going to take a trip to Hot Springs, Arkansas. And, and the whole big culmination was supposed to be Magic Springs. So we figured, let's just go ahead and make that the whole theme. And we found tickets to Hot Springs' number one attraction, the Maxwell Blade Magic Show in the historic downtown Malco Theater, which was, you know, we didn't really know what we were getting into. A couple of people said, hey, this is, this is a fun thing. It's entertaining. It'll be a good little ramp up, the penultimate event to the big shebang, right? And so we go and we walk in and we were simply blown away. All right, this was, it, it was equal parts like David Copperfield style illusions and uh, a little bit of Stand-up comedy, maybe. Uh, and then also, for some reason, an Elton John impersonation section. It was, it was really bizarre. The only thing that I can say is that I was highly entertained. Uh, and when we ended up having to leave that trip early because of a COVID you know, exposure, uh, the thing we look back on and remember about that trip the most fondly is Maxwell Blade. He absolutely misdirected all of our attention from all of the things we weren't getting to do and all of the, 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 the disasters of scheduling and canceled plans and disappointment. And we were, for a brief moment, in the magic. It was fantastic. We have a kind of a mixed uh, history with magic uh, as a culture. You know, uh, magic is one of those things where we think of ourselves as enlightened 21st century, you know, uh, scientific minded people. And so obviously magic isn't real, but also we're super obsessed with it. Like m a lot of our shows sort of revolve around it. And we can tell ourselves that, you know, that's a literary device and it's, it's interesting and, you know, it's nice to have escapism and fantasy. But really at the end of the day, we all kind of wish we could do it. We, we wish that we had the thing that we're watching. And in fact, if someone were to offer it to us, I don't think we would have very many qualms at all with trying to participate. And so we see in this passage something that uh, at first blush, maybe we go, oh, that's something that people in antiquity dealt with. It's not really something that we modern people uh, deal with. But that's in fact not at all true. This morning, I want us to see, uh, I'm going to walk through the outline here, magic and misdirection. And then I want us to see, again, the sign and the signified. If you were with us a few weeks ago, you remember we talked about the difference between those two things. And then bondage and bitterness. So let's look at verse 4 again, magic and misdirection. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now, you're going to see a little bit of a contrast here, okay? You're going to see two different people doing things, or at least having the reputation for doing things, that would be considered supernatural, all right? You have the natural order of things, and then you have someone coming and subverting those things or standing over those things. But there are different purposes, and so these, these acts are given different words. Philip is doing supernatural things, but he's never said to be doing magic, What's the difference? Well, since we start with Philip, let's just look at what miracles are. And miracles are, like magic, events that supersede the natural order. But here's a huge difference. Miracles are done in order to serve and restore our humanity. All right, and so we, we can see this a little bit. The, the, the kinds of things we talk about as miracles, even in like a, a post-enlightenment rationalist mindset, we still talk about things uh, as miraculous. For example, medicines or technologies, right? They, they, they do something for us. E even, even the kinds of technologies that allow us to do things like wealth transference, 
absolutely miraculous that we were able to provide for X need or we were able to to contribute to this thing or we were able to, to somehow rise above the natural order of decay in our lives and at least for a moment to forestall it or to redeem it. Miracles are often called signs in Scripture for a reason because they actually point us to the truth of who we are. This is a huge difference between magic and miracles. Miracles are signs. They're they're actually, they're not the thing itself. They're pointing to something else. Namely, what is it that's broken in this world and how is God restoring it? And so they end up being a sign. God won't necessarily heal every single uh, person who is broken in a community, but the healings that he does in a story, especially in the Gospels, are pointing them to a deeper reality about what is coming because of who he is. And what Philip is doing is he's actually not drawing attention to anything other than the message that he's preaching. And what is the message? the good news. We've seen it articulated over and over and over again by the apostles in the previous seven verses and or seven chapters and by a deacon named Stephen who does a great job of laying it all out. This is who the king is and this is the kingdom that he is bringing. And access to this kingdom is free because of who Jesus is. In that kingdom, the poor are restored and captives are set free. And, and so Philip is actually demonstrating that that's happening. People are being healed and captives are being set free. And there is much joy. Like That's the sign of these miracles, that there is much joy. That, that people are participating in this thing irrespective of, of their gender, their background, their race, whatever is going on. Everybody can have a piece of this thing. And Philip is offering it freely. And every bit of that is an affirmation of humanity's dependency upon God for every good thing. Philip is saying this is a gift from God. This is a gift from God. This is a gift from God. He's saying it over and over and over again. Now, the contrast is really important here. There are a lot of instances of the word but here in this passage, and here's one of them. Verse 9, but there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Magic is also a kind of mastery over the natural world, but actually the motivation of magic is to abandon the dependency of humanity. Actually, I'm not interested in being dependent on anyone else, and so I'm going to utilize magic and over, in order to get over the natural world, because the natural world is scary. It's something that's opposed to me, and that's something we can relate to, right? I mean, everything out there is conspiring against us. It's, it's a terrifying place. It's sometimes the, most, the bravest thing you can do is walk out your front door. And so the idea that we would be able to exercise mastery over this world, that's a huge benefit to us. And there are a lot of things that we could classify as magic with a little bit of imagination that we just think of as everyday things. What if you were to get an inside stock tip? That's magic. Because that's power that I have over a natural order that nobody else has. And so now I can put myself above that and hedge myself from all of the risk out there. It's magical. Magic is mastery over the natural world in order to abandon the dependency that is natural to humanity. The writer uh, Andy Crouch says it this way, The alchemists, these were the the people uh, in the the medieval period who were trying to, to... 
turned things like iron or bronze into gold. All right, They didn't have the periodic table. They didn't realize that these things couldn't be transformed, that they, that they had kind of like an atomic reality that they were dealing with. They were just like, hey, what would happen if we kind of mess around with it a little bit and change it from this to this? Well, that would make us independent, right? Because if I figure out how to turn something I have a lot of into something that's pretty scarce, to, to transfer that, now I've got wealth. And what is wealth? Wealth is power. What do I do with power? I protect myself from the unpredictability of nature, from, from having to submit myself to things that are more powerful than me. The alchemists considered themselves to be performing magic, not in the sense of impressive or charming tricks, but in the sense of unlocking and acquiring the ability to command nature. The word command is essential. Magic is essentially about understanding the world. Ironic if we note that the, world's, the, the word's humble implication that true knowledge involves standing under something. But magic is about standing over, not under. At the heart of magic is the belief that, given the right code words, a human being can gain unquestioned control of forces at the heart of the cosmos. Now, we do this all the time, especially with code words. You know, there are people that are just like, they're just a little bit charming. You think about where that word comes from? A charm. It's a magic charm. I have the right code words, the right demeanor, the right uh, posture. I can take my magic wand and flick it in the right way, and then people will do what I want them to. All right, I, I have uh, one child who is more charming than the other children and tends to get their way. I'm not telling you which one that is, but if you know my kids, you already know. Okay? It's a magical little person who can make people do things that they want them to do. It's, it's kind of magic. There are code words that are involved. Some of it is just like, uh, you know, it, it's manners. What, what do we say about saying please and thank you? What's the magic word? We give people magic. We give it to them. And we think this will help you get far in life. It will help you exert control over the world around you. If you can be charming. We spend our days using magic code words. Here are three of them. Siri. Alexa. Hey, Google. And, and by using the magic words, we can then get the things that we want to stand over nature. Things that we used to have to walk across the room to do, now we've got a magic wand called a remote control. And we just point it at the Palantir and it shows us oracles from another world. And it helps us to escape where we've been. Right? It's just a little bit of imagination. We could totally put ourselves into this story. Maybe we are actually captivated by magic. Maybe we do actually want to be magicians after all. Arthur Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's certainly true. I don't know how my microwave works. I don't know how. It's magic. It may as well be. If the grid goes down and somebody looks at me and says, you've got to recreate the microwave, I'm going to build a fire. I'm not going to make a microwave. I don't know how to do it. It's magical. The world is a scary, dangerous place, and magic is tempting. So the question we have to ask ourselves is when we're participating in magic, when we're utilizing something that helps us exercise mastery over this world in one way or another, what is our motivation? That's the difference. What is our motivation? Is it to restore people's humanity, ourselves and our communities, or is it to deny our humanity and to elevate ourselves to deity, people who aren't dependent on anyone or anything? Look at verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. I want you to note that historically, Across space and time, baptism is an act of submission. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. 
Now, there's a parallel here that you may have missed that I want to draw your attention to, and it's this. It's that the people are paying attention to both, all right? They paid attention to Philip, and they paid attention to Simon. Actually, more accurately, they paid attention to Simon, and they paid attention to what Philip was teaching. There's actually a difference there. There's, there's a difference in object. You see, this whole time, we may have been thinking of ourselves as, a, this is a comparison of Simon to Philip. But that's not true. That's how Simon saw it, but that's not the reality. It's actually a comparison of Simon, who says he's great and amazing and has power, and the one Philip preaches, who is the Christ, who has power and greatness and is amazing. Now compare Simon to Jesus And that's an even more distant separation. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Magician's Nephew, said, What you see and what you hear depends a great deal upon where you are standing. It also depends upon what sort of person you are. Simon the Amazing called himself that. I'm amazing and I'm great and you can see it. And he used his magic to direct people's attention toward himself. He was amazing, and now we see in this passage, he was amazed. You see, what you're looking for is what you're going to find. It's what he's been looking for, so it's what he sees. Magic draws attention to the magician, their power. But it's actually, it's, it's one of the primary uh, elements of magic is a thing called misdirection. You see, if I'm doing the trick over here, I'm going to be getting your attention over here because I don't want you to see the mechanism of my magic. I want you way over here, even though what's actually happening is right here. That's exactly what Simon Magus, the magician, is doing. He's taking glory for himself. He doesn't need God. He is the power of God. Don't miss the, like, the blasphemy of that. He's actually comparing himself to the power of God. Philip directed their attention not to himself, but on the true power of God. He didn't preach himself, but a king and a kingdom. And that's actually really important because you can read this whole passage and you can fall prey to misdirection. You can think this whole thing is about all of the power and how it's manifested and whether it's a magic or a miracle and who got baptized when and in what order. That's misdirection. What's actually happening is a king and his kingdom. Philip didn't confuse the sign and the signified. I want us to look at it now. Look at verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them to Peter and John. They sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is an act of submission, but it's a specific thing. It's a sign and seal of what it signifies, all right? So uh, some of the language that we use is that it's an outward sign of an inward reality, right? You've probably heard that before. What is the inward reality? It's cleansing and and second birth. New creation in Christ's spirit. Okay, that's that's the thing that it means, all right? So there's, there's baptism with water that we do, and then Jesus says that he baptized with fire, with the spirit. But those aren't two separate things. They're two parts of one thing, the sign and the signified. They go together. They belong together together. And one of our temptations is to go ahead and separate. We're constantly separating, constantly separating the flesh and the spirit in ways that they ought not be. The sign signified, when you see one, you know that the other is nearby. In John 3, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it wishes And you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, this is a huge principle that you got to grab a hold of here. Because if you don't, we're going to turn baptism into a magic trick. 
And that is a huge mistake. And it's actually a mistake that we're guilty of and we don't even realize it. When we overemphasize the, the, the means and the methodology and, and the people who are participating in it. That's the last thing we want to do. The order of baptism in, in ba- being baptized by water and receiving the Spirit actually varies in the book of Acts. We only see one instance here, and so the temptation is to take it out and to say, okay, this is what we're supposed to do. It's this, and then this, and then this, and then you got to have this certain person do this, and you got to have that. No, no, no. That's magic. That's saying you've got to memorize the spell, and you've got to flick your wrist just right, and you got to make sure that you're the sorcerer with all the right power, and, and that the person with the hat gets to do the thing. And that'll be to miss the whole point of this passage, okay? We can have all kinds of conversations about what ordination does and doesn't mean, about the the appropriate application of sacraments in honor of the Lord. But what this passage is telling us is that what matters in baptism is the work of the Spirit. The, The Westminster Divines wanted to be really clear about this as they wrote their confession, and so they said it this way. The grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them. Okay? So it's not about the thing that we're doing. Neither does the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that does administer it. Okay? So it's not about the Sumerians and it's not about Philip. Who's it about? It's about the Spirit. There is no indication in this passage at all of a defect in the the Samaritan's faith, okay? It's not that they were baptized, but they didn't receive the Spirit because they didn't have good faith. They, like, didn't believe it right. There's no indication in the passage at all of that. There's also no indication that, like, Philip did something wrong. When, When the apostles come, they don't make any corrections or addenda. They just pray to the Spirit. That's all they do. They pray for the Spirit to move. That's it. The apostles don't correct or add anything to the message or the method. So why the delay? I mean, isn't that what we want to know? Why why does it take time for the Spirit to come upon these people? If it's not about their methodology or the message that was preached, what is it about? Daryl Bach really appreciate this commentator. He says, there is no set pattern for dispensing the Spirit in the book of Acts. There's not actually a pattern at all. It's so willy-nilly. I think that's on purpose. At various junctures, God acts in different ways for different purposes. Special circumstances make a break in the pattern. Why? To underscore a fresh move of God. This is a special legitimization taking place here because of the potential controversy of Samaritan inclusion. Okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pull back the veil, all right? I don't want you to participate in the misdirection. Keep your eyes on the setting. This is the key to this whole passage. Where are they? Samaria. This is a big deal. It's a big deal for a lot of reasons, but let me just, let let me give you a thousand years of Samaritan history, all right, in in like a minute, all right? Uh, After Solomon, the kingdom was divided. Rehoboam, his son, took Judah, uh, Judea, Judah, the south, and Jeroboam, a military commander, took the north, okay? And that was a disaster. The very first thing he did was set up idols on the mountains, on the high places. They looked like golden calves, which immediately should have made them go, ding, 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 this is a bad idea. But they didn't. They just went with it, all right? And so there on Mount Gerizim, uh, eventually they start, uh, they start associating the god of their mountains with Zeus. I mean, they're just absolutely abandoning the faith altogether. So much so that missionaries from Assyria, capital being Nineveh, you've heard of those guys, they had to go back and actually preach the gospel to the northern tribes, which is absurd. It's like how people from China and Africa are coming to America to preach the gospel to us. It feels so backwards, but that's how bad things have gotten. 
All right. Then when, when Assyria actually takes them over, he, they start mixing them uh, with, with other races of other people that they had uh, enslaved. And so now they're like, they're mudbloods. We don't even know if they have any of the good stuff in them anymore. And they're worshiping foreign gods. They're doing the bad stuff. Well, then they, they're in exile for a long time, but there's still people there and they're sort of, you know, doing their thing. Well, then Antiochus Epiphanes starts persecuting uh, the southern kingdom and they cheer, of course, because, you know, the southern guys think that they're better than us. Well, so then the Maccabees, when they control, gain power again, they go up north and they destroy the capital city of Samaria. They just level it to the ground. Then Herod the Great actually rebuilt it in honor of Caesar. That's a thousand years. This is bad news. This is terrible blood. This is Hatfields and McCoys. You see it over and over again in the New Testament. They're, these guys, they're not Jews, but they're not Gentiles. They're like somewhere in between. They don't fit in a box except for the one that we've labeled, do not open. We don't want to have anything to do with these people. John chapter 4, when, when Jesus goes to the woman at the well, who is a Samaritan woman, there's a little uh, indicator here that says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. No dealings. We have cut them off. They are dead to us. They are shunned. The setting actually is what focuses us on why the Spirit delays until the apostles arrive. Now we can start kind of thinking about why in the world are these two things separated? Well, for one thing, there are two things that are separated that should never be separated, just like the northern and southern kingdoms. Maybe they're waiting for the, the blessing of the official authority on behalf of, remember, we've already just established that now the Sanhedrin is not in charge of Jerusalem. It's actually the apostles who are the, the authority of the temple. And so now they're coming down, and maybe it's about a legitimization in that way, that, that we want the, 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 the guys at the, the head of the hierarchy to be able to come and to put their blessing on it. Maybe. Some people say that. Some people don't. S some people say that it was actually for Peter's sake. It wasn't even about the people that were there at all. God wanted Peter to see with his own eyeballs that he was including the Samaritans. Because we know that Peter has a hard time with people that are not like him. Peter had to be told over and over and over again. Peter will have to be sent over to Cornelius. Peter will have to be, uh, you know, dog cussed by, by Paul eventually over this issue. That these people can be included. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's just to subvert the magic of it all entirely. Oh, you think you know the formula? No, you don't. The Spirit is in charge. And he will blow as he will. But ultimately, let's not miss this. It's actually not about us at all. We can't do it right. The book of Acts is about the risen and reigning Christ. He's the main character even of this story, even though we can very easily just sort of gloss over him. Jesus is risen and reigning here. This is a huge deal. Remember, the last thing he said before he ascended in Acts 1 uh, uh, verse 8, he said, look, uh, my spirit will be upon you and you will go and be my witnesses. Where? First in Jerusalem. That was the first seven chapters. Then where? Judea and Samaria. And then to the ends of the earth. Uh, people ask the question, is that four things or three things? That's actually the perfect question. Because they are four things that should be three things. They were supposed to be. Judea and Samaria are one kingdom, and they were rent, they were divided in a way that they never should have been before. In keeping with the magic theme, okay, this is like the magician's bride has been sawed in half, okay? The magic trick is not sawing a woman in half. That is, that's possible. That's physically possible. I don't recommend it. The magic is putting her back together again. That's the feat, and it stops being magic, and it starts being a miracle when it's pointing to something. When it's pointing to something bigger. What does it mean for these two nations to come together, for Judea and Samaria to be talked about as one kingdom again? The power of God restores, redeems, renews. It sets captives free. It heals that which was broken. That which was rent asunder can be put back together again. 
This is what's happening. And God gives Peter and John a front row seat to that. They aren't the ones in control here. They're just the guys in the front row. And they're blown away by it just like everybody else. We don't know how it works. You notice they didn't come down to like set it right. They just came down to pray. They were like, we know these things go together and they're not together. And so we're going to pray. And then God puts them together. That is the thing that's being signified here. Once he puts his bride back together again, so he establishes his temple in Jerusalem. He puts his bride back together again in Samaria, and then he sends her out to the ends of the earth. That was the plan from the very beginning. And now we're seeing it happen here. But what stands in the way of that? God's got his plan. He's doing his thing. He's made a distinction between magic and miracles, and he said, this is the way we're going. This is the thing that we're doing. We are restoring creation through new creation, through the work of Christ as he pours out his spirit on his people, brings us back together again. So, what you see depends a lot on where you're standing and what kind of person you are. What does Simon see? Verse 18, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I may lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. (laughs) He totally missed it. He has fallen prey to misdirection. Remember, he was the magician, and now he's the one that's amazed. And he's just sitting there taking notes. He's just trying to figure it out. How does he do it? I want to do it like he does it. What what does he even see when the Spirit is imparted that he wants so badly to be able to do it? You ever think about that? Like, how did they know the Spirit was uh, imparted on these people? Uh, Maybe tongues, maybe signs, maybe... We actually don't know. And I think that's on purpose because we can get so easily tempted to see the sign instead of what it signifies, So we don't get to know. We just see through the eyes of Simon. He wants it, but it would be misdirection to focus on it. C.S. Lewis said in The Abolition of Man, he he, kind of gives us these categories again. There is something which unites magic and applied science, which we would call technology, while separating them from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem of human life was how to conform the soul to objective reality. And the solution was wisdom, self-discipline, and virtue. What, what, is, what is objective reality? It's that there's one king, and he has one kingdom, and we serve that kingdom, okay? And that's the whole pu- purpose and point. For the modern, the cardinal problem is how to conform reality to the wishes of man. And the solution is a technique. It's magic, Simon is actually, his obsession with magic is not an antiquity problem. It's actually a pretty modern problem. He's the most modern guy in this passage. He's the one saying, how do I bend the world to my preferences? How do I make sure that all of the algorithms of my devices only give me things that are pleasing to my eyes? That sounds a lot like us. That sounds a lot like the world that billionaires are creating for us and for themselves if you, if you explore the things that billionaires are spending their money on, it's, it's how to keep themselves from dying. That's basically it. They're just as scared as we are of the world, and they want to buy a new bag of magic tricks to cheat their way out of it. It's exactly what Simon wants. It's exactly what our flesh wants. But it is not just a better bag of tricks that you can buy. Verse 20, Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Oh, man. Simon sees the flash and the bang. Peter sees into this guy's heart. And it's the real issue here. What's the matter that Simon has no part or lot in? 
It's the Samaritan inclusion. You, you can't possibly help us midwife this thing because you're still making everything about you and your control and your power. You have no place in this. But that's not a condemnation he's giving. It's a little bit more like a warning. Simon wanted mastery over the highest power. He was just like the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Peter's seen this before. You're just like those guys. They want to act like they're so different from the Samaritans. But all flesh is the same. It's all the same. No, there is no place in the Messiah's united kingdom for conforming reality to the wishes of a mere man. We are conforming earth to life in heaven under one king, under one master. There is one detail that nearly every story about magic gets right, and it is this. Magic always incurs a debt. You see it in every story over and over and over again. Faustus, the, the princess and the frog, right? The shadow man gets sucked into the netherworld because he couldn't pay his debt for all the magic that he had used. There's a, a, a German philosopher and poet, Goethe, who wrote a, 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 a poem called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And you know this because you've seen Mickey Mouse be the Sorcerer's Apprentice, right? In Fantasia. That, what a fantastic story that, that he's, you know, he's the sorcerer's apprentice, but really all that means is filling up the buckets and, and mopping and sweeping and kind of taking care of stuff. And he sees what the sorcerer can do and he wants it for himself. And so he takes the hat and he puts it on and he starts making the broom do his work for him and the mops and they're all kind of taking care of stuff and he's really enjoying it because he's so tired and then he falls asleep. And then when he wakes up, he realizes that it's just madly out of control. It's going wildly out of control. And there's this line that captures the essence of what happened here. This spirit which I have summoned, I now cannot banish. I thought that I was going to be in charge, that I would enslave the forces of supernaturality in order to make the world safe for me and easy and comfortable for me. I thought that getting an iPhone would make my life easier. It didn't, did it? Who's the slave? And who's the master? This spirit I have summoned. I cannot banish. It's hard. Simon was tangled up in the powers he thought he was using. They were using him. He only looked like the hero of the town. Really, he was the most enslaved person in that whole town. He was obsessed with making sure that everybody was paying attention to him, but the him that he wanted them to see. Peter was impervious to that. He saw straight through. The emperor had no clothes. He knew that if he, if, if he even could, he wouldn't give that power to Simon because he would only use it to further enslave himself and others. Jesus said it this way in Luke 16, No servant can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Money is just a marker for power that we can hold and use. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all of these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Everyone paid attention to Simon, and they exalted him and everything that he did. And God looked at it, and he said, that is slavery. You are enslaved. Peter sees through the smoke and mirrors that Simon is enslaved to what? To bitterness and iniquity, and the bond of iniquity, sin. Why do you need mastery over the world, Simon? Well, you were hurt. And you think you're the only one who can protect yourself from being hurt. And so you're going to amass all of these different ways to control the world around you so no one else can ever hurt you again. I have sympathy for that, but he's a grown man. He needs to take responsibility for his life and for his wounds and take them where they can be healed instead of pretending like he has it all together. I'm just talking about Simon. I'm not talking about any of us at all. 
Why do you need everyone's attention, Simon? To direct tension away from his wounds and toward the things that he can do. Performance, charm, talent, money. All the things that we use as magic tricks and charms to misdirect people from what's really going on in our hearts. Especially those who can help us. And this is, this is so beautiful. Peter actually gives a call for repentance. He doesn't give condemnation. He convicts him. He tells him exactly what's wrong. But man, we just saw a few chapters earlier, the last people who got convicted in front of everybody dropped dead. This is, I mean, this is actually kind of (laughs) nice what he does here. He gives him an opportunity. And Simon answered, verse 24, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken of the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many of the villages of the Samaritans. There's a huge question about whether, is this, is this the sorcerer's repentance? Has this guy actually repented? Is this a sign of fruit in his life? Or is it just more bondage? To me, it looks a little bit more like bondage, but I don't know the rest of his story. And I know that Jesus could free him, certainly. For Simon, miracles were only magic. They were, just, they were better magic, and he wanted to buy them. And the messengers were just better masters. He still, Peter says, hey, listen, you have direct free access to God. He'll heal that wound in you. He'll free you from the bondage that's tying you to this uh, obsessive need to be in control of everybody's attention and affection all the time. And what does he say? No, 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 no. I don't have that kind of access. The one thing I know about power is that you've got to have some kind of, you know, mediator and magician. And so then he asks Peter to pray for him. Is that instead of him exercising a relationship with Christ? I don't know. But I do know this. He's still a little bit enslaved. And there are no magic words for us either. We're a little bit enslaved to the things that we thought were going to serve us and give us control and freedom. And there is only surrender to the Spirit of Christ, who was, remember, in the beginning of this passage, banishing the spirits of darkness. That's, that was the whole gig. Simon saw Philip freeing other people, and he went, oh, that's a cool magic trick. Instead of seeing him and going, oh, I'm enslaved too, I need help too. I need the gospel. Can somebody help me and surrender himself? We can sell ourselves to slavery here or to slavery here. There's only one king. There's only one kingdom. There's only one master. And he requires our submission. And his spirit is free of cost. So let us come to him.